Simon um, was a zealot. Anybody remember what a zealot is? A zealot was a radical, and the zealots wanted one thing. They wanted to overthrow Rome with bloodshed. They were going to get the Romans out of there. They, they were a Jewish group that was very radical, uh, and, um, and the Romans called them terrorists. Um, but they, they wanted Rome out of there, and, and, um, and Simon was a zealot. And now Matthew, on the other hand, he was a tax collector. Now, what did the tax collectors believe? about Rome. Yeah, you, government, Rome must be acquiesced to, um, that, um, that Rome, if not, is a good thing, um, but it, it, um, it's there for a reason and must be served, obeyed, um, a place for, a way for Jews to be wealthy from it. And so within, within Jesus' disciples, you have the furthest people in, that, in the Jewish world from one another politically, all the way from a tax collector all the way down to a zealot. And they both said, when Jesus called them, follow me, they both said, yes. They both dropped their nets, they dropped their swords, they dropped their tax, whatever what tax collectors have, ledgers, <laughs> money, they dropped their money. Oh, they, that's exactly what uh, Zacchaeus said, they dropped their money. And, um, and so I can imagine that they probably had radically different worldviews. I mean, can you imagine sitting around the, 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 the Passover table with this group of people? I mean, just radically different worldviews, but they served Jesus together. And I love, I think most of the churches in this town have much more monolithic voting blocks than our church does. Our church has all kinds of different people in it. And I think that it's a, um, it's a wonderful thing that um, God has called us from many different places and, um, and called us to do one thing, and that's to follow, to follow Jesus. And, um, and even when we disagree very, um, um, on very big important things like worldview, um, there's a worldview that we have that, that is more important than that, and that's being called by Jesus. So there's a reflection about um, how we can come together and, um, and follow Jesus even when we have major disagreements. Um, we're going to review now the entire book of Exodus um, because this is our last lesson on it and I want you to have an opportunity to ask questions because we've been, we've been covering so much ground every week. Um, the, the first thing that we learned on the first day is that Exodus was, uh, I called it, the movement of God's people. That it is a paradigm, a pattern for Christian living. Can anybody explain what that looks like? Like, what, what am I saying when I say that? It's been repeated over and over. Yeah, so, so that um, while I think the Exodus story is something rooted in history, it is also a myth. And then it becomes, the Exodus story is my story. I'm a person that moved from slavery um, to a pharaonic narrative to liberation by God's call, from slavery to liberation. And, um, and so it is our, our story. It's the Christian story. We looked at some New Testament references to the Exodus as Jesus' story, as the church's story. And so um, the Exodus is our story. Now, we've also looked at the Exodus as gospel. How is the Exodus gospel? Hmm? Yeah, Maisie? That's right. Yeah, the, the main thing that I wanted us to know from this, oh. hope. Okay, yeah, the, the main thing I wanted us to know from this is that, that we have gotten this bad idea <laughs> that the Old Testament is about this mean God that does bad things, and then the New Testament, and, about the, and the law is, we, we read, we talk about the law from Martin Luther's perspective, that it's this heavy, oppressive thing. And then the New Testament is about, well, it's about grace, and Jesus is, the God is a nice God, and you're a good, good, good cop, bad cop. This is really bad theology. Um, whenever we make the God the Father the bad cop and Jesus the good cop, we are really tearing apart the Trinity in ways that are completely heretical. And um, the Old Testament story 
The Old Testament story is the same story as the New Testament. And that story is that God has come to a people, you and me, the Hebrews, that did not deserve it. And God made something out of nothing. We call this grace. That God saves people, not because of anything they've done to deserve, not because of their own good work, because they were, they were on the right path, but God saves people because that's who God is. It's the story of grace. The Exodus story is the story of the cross, and the narrative of Scripture is one solid narrative. So I want us to get over the idea of the bad Old Testament. Who's afraid of the Old Testament, God? Because <laughs> yeah, that is not, not accurate. Would you say that the Old Testament is Christ concealed in the New Testament is Christ revealed? Yeah, he said that Old Testament is Christ concealed, New Testament is Christ revealed. I think that's helpful. I like the way Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, the reformer, said it. Um, similar to that, he said that it, in the Old Testament we find Jesus, but sometimes, like the infant Jesus, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, and that um, it, 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 we have to look a little deeper. But um, but the core message is is still the gospel. Still the gospel. Um, there's a good quote for us to write down and memorize and maybe get tattoos. Um, it says, Gregory Nancy Anson said, When I say God, I mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so the God that speaks from the burning bush is Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Yahweh is the whole, that, that's that, that secret name of God we've been talking about. That, that is the whole trinity. And that you can't have one person with, without the other. And so, um, like the book of Hebrews says, chapter 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How does Abraham find salvation? Well, Jesus gave it to him. I mean, how does Moses find salvation? Because Jesus gave it to him that the Trinity, the Trinity is, um, is the God of all of Scripture. He's involved in creation. Um, we've got that in uh, many places. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was, uh, word was God. And, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. John chapter 1, verse 9. And so, um, and the Holy Spirit, we've got that in Psalm 33. Um, the Holy Spirit is involved in creation. The Holy Spirit is God's wisdom. And so, um, so when God works anywhere in the world, it is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Christ is, Christ is the light that lights everyone. So um, when God does God's work, even with people that aren't Christians, it's Jesus also working. You can't just divide up, you can't divide up the, the Trinity. Um, the Trinity is indivisible and yet distinct in their persons. Let's move a little bit further here. We've talked about liberation um, as an Exodus theme. Um, and, and related to that, Exodus justice. Uh, somebody else tell us about Exodus justice. What is that like? Do you remember? We spent a long time on this one. It was kind of a hard one, too. And my argument is a little bit... So, so what we have heard said is that Exodus justice is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And yet, what I say to you, <laughs> to coin a phrase, is that Exodus justice is much more radical than that. That Exodus justice is to see wholeness in community and people where widows and orphans and the poor are taken care of, where the, where the stranger and the alien is welcomed in. And when, when we look at the entire, when we look at the entire narrative, Exodus justice is how God found a people that weren't a people, and a people who had no God, and God made them a people, and God made them their God. And so Exodus justice is not like American justice that is defined in a negative way, where we have justice and freedom from things. And um, but but justice. In the Exodus way is is wholeness, not a positive, a positive justice, and it is much more radical than giving somebody what they deserve. So we we in America, based on Aristotle's definition, define justice as giving people what they deserve. That's justice. Exodus justice is mercy, giving people what they don't deserve, and making them whole. And that is much more radical, much more radical than the Constitution. Constitution is a great document, and it's wonderful. It's helped us a lot.
But the gospel is Exodus style justice, and it is more radical than the world has ever seen. In fact, it's too, we talk about it being too radical for us. You know, we talk about, like, what if somebody comes in your house and, 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 and uh, tries to attack you? I mean, we, we, and we're saying, well, I mean, are you asking me what Jesus would do? <laughs> what I would do? And, uh, and it's Exodus justice that aim towards this uh, beatific vision, uh, that aim towards this, um, to God's great goal, is where the, the peaceable kingdom, where the lamb lies down with the lion, um, that, that is, um, more, in many ways, more than we can handle, and yet it is where we ought to be headed in our daily action. Now, what about plundering the Egyptians? Anybody remember about how we plunder the Egyptians and why we would do that? Restitution. Okay. Restitution. Yeah, that was a, that, that's part of some justice. Plundering the Egyptians. What does it mean? I mean what does it mean to us? What are we going to learn from that? What did John Wesley tell us to do? Huh? Oh, come Plunder on. Plunder good ideas. All right. Plunder good ideas. Yeah. John Wesley said, yeah, if there's a good tune they're singing down at the tavern, well, let's sing that tune in church. If there's something that's working out there, if there's art, culture, intellectual ideas, if anything out there that is good, it can belong to us. That it can, it can be baptized and brought in. And I, I think that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful concept. We aren't afraid of any of that stuff. The Lord can um, can reuse it. No. Yeah, let no man call it clean what God has ordained clean. Very, very good. Very good. And what about a located God? You remember when we said what Flannery O'Connor said? I'd rather be somewhere than, than anywhere. Okay. What does it mean that God's got a location? A moving God, yeah. This this God wants to be in a travel trailer, um, not not a temple. He's a moving God in this moving tabernacle, and um, and I think that we learn two things that are diametrically opposed to one another. It's a paradox. This God is not going to be out here in in the spiritual world. This God is going to be in this moment and in this place. That's what the tabernacle means. That this God has a place, a location. But it also means that this God, you can't put in your pocket. Um, this God is a wild God, and the God move, this God moves. So while this God has a place, you can't control where God is. Um, and so um, it, it's almost um, paradoxical, um, but, but both of these are true. God refuses to be formed and locate God's self inside an idol like the gods of the pagan world. Um, this God is in open space above the mercy seat, between the seraphim, and, um, and comes and goes at God's leisure. Uh, what do we say about idolatry? What is idolatry? Whatever your heart clings to. That was, the, that was the money quote. Martin Luther said that. Whatever your heart clings to, that is your God. And... Um, it is a summary of the entire Ten Commandments. Coveting your neighbor's donkey is, <laughs> is an idolatry. See, every not practicing Sabbath is idolatry. Um, so all the commandments can be explained by what it means to worship this God, who is known, especially in the book of Exodus, um, how do we know anything about this God? Well, this God is a speaking God, and this God defines himself as I am Yahweh, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So in order to, in order to worship this liberating God, you can't go around and murder people. And you can't, you can't oppress other people because you worship a liberating God. Does that make sense? If, if you want to oppress people, well, then you need an oppressive God like Pharaoh's. But this is a liberating God, and if you worship this God, you, can't, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. And 1 John basically says the same thing. If you say that you love God, but you, who you can't see, but then you don't love your neighbor that you can see, well, you're a liar. And um, that's exactly, I think, what the Ten Commandments teaches us in two different sides. And... Um, Okay, so what does the book of Exodus say about God? Somebody that hasn't spoken in it. What, is, what do you think the book of Exodus says about God? 
He's the keeper of his promises. Yeah, yeah. He said, a loving and protected God, he provided for them. Loving and protecting. Yeah. I think the main thing that it says about this God he means what he says. is that God loves to make something out of nothing. And, and that God is merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, chesed. That's that unconditional love. And um, that is how God reveals God's nature to the, to the world. What does the book of Exodus say about humanity? Now we're doing anthropology. Humanity. What does it say about us? Slow learners. Slow learners. Slow learners. Excuse me. Decidedly in need of salvation. Decidedly in need of salvation. I think it says that um, that people are not able to help themselves. That the only way forward is God. That, that there's, I mean, um, that Moses didn't say, everybody get your swords, we're going to fight those Egyptians and escape out this door. And what happened? The Lord just opened the doors for them. And they walked out. I mean, they, they couldn't have gotten out if it had not been for the Lord. And so it, um, what it says about us is that we are in need of salvation. We are in need of assistance. And we do not have the capacity and capability to do it ourselves. That only God can be our deliverer. Wonderful. Okay, now um, let's see uh, anybody has some questions about the book of Exodus. Something that you've missed, something that you saw, something that you say, well, I wonder what the preacher would say about that. Oh, no, Beth. <sighs> I, I missed last week. And, <laughs> and when I reviewed the text that was read, on the same page of my Bible, we had the story of God placing Moses in the cleft. And I will pass before you, but, but you will not see my face, he said. You'll see my backside. But in the just in the just before that passage, it's talking about how Moses and God were face to face. And so I've been puzzling about that ever since. So why did why did in one situation God said, You won't see my face? But yet the text is saying before that, that I believe that text before there, Moses is as praying a prayer. Let your let your goodness pass before my eyes. And so, um, so Moses doesn't really um, get to see the face of Moses. I, I, I could be missing something, but, um, but I think that the way that we understand it is that Moses did not get to see God's face, but he got to speak to, oh, he got to speak to, to, to Yahweh, the Lord, like a friend does. Yeah, this, um, yeah, is that what it means? Yes. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, face, to face. one speaks to a friend. As one speaks to a friend. That's a beautiful text. And, um, but Moses was not a, while well, they were face to face. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful question there. Thank you. Um, what else? I was going to bring out the same, but then I also thought about Moses, even though he spoke with God face to face. He also seen his glory. Yeah. And that's, that's how I took it as also, also face to face. Yeah. That, uh, that just, a, just a glimpse of the Lord's backside is enough to make Moses glow. I just imagine my grandparents wore these like big visors you know, when they drove a car. And uh, I just imagine everybody in, in Israel needing these big visors and, uh, and just Moses' face just, just shining like the sun. Can you imagine, with Moses just being in God's presence, not even seeing him visually, but just being in his presence. And he comes down off the mountain, and he is so visually different yeah. that people are actually afraid of him. Now, just that, that presence. And I think about us, we think this side of the cross, that we ought to be closer to the Lord than they could have been on the other side. And yet, how many of us have a visual uh, something yeah. emanating from us to, to identify us as having been with God. You know, right, it's, it's right. quite a rebuke. <clears throat> we need to be transfigured a little bit more. <laughs> if we could only practice it. Yeah, that's, um, oh, Can I, I love, there was a, uh, uh, um, a politician, I think, who told Mark Twain, I can't wait to, um, to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I'm going to climb up on the Mount uh, in 
Mount Sinai. And um, one of the things I want to do there is is read the Ten Commandments in the wind. And Mark Twain said, I think you ought to just stay home and keep them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really easy to read in Exodus, <laughs> read the Ten Commandments, but it's another thing to keep them, right? And uh, I think that's a, whew, that hits hard. But it is, it is symbolic that the covenant is broken. And, um, and isn't it amazing, I mean, what's even deeper symbolic here is that they got a brand new covenant and they already broke it, and the Lord just gives them a new one. I mean, like when we, our, our covenant with the Lord is, um, is remarkable. I mean, uh, because the Lord never breaks the Lord's side of the covenant. Always faithful, I and mean, we break our side, but the Lord's always there. The, the, the Lord never breaks it and, and renews the covenant. And that's where um, I got asked even recently, I was baptized as a child, um, but I, I would like to be baptized now in the bay as an adult because I, my faith, I, I, I had some bad years. I walked away from the faith and now I've come back. And you know what our answer is? Um, we can't do it. It's, in, it's impossible to baptize someone for a second time because it is a covenant with God and God did not break the covenant. So while you might have... You might have reneged on your part of the covenant. You can come before church, reaffirm your faith. We can renew your baptismal vows. We can mark a cross of water on your head as a sign of that renewal. But we cannot reestablish the covenant because there's no problem with the covenant. The covenant is God's promise. And, and, and until God breaks it, you can't be baptized again. And God ain't going to break it. And so um, that's um, it's powerful. That's powerful to know that when we let go of God, God does not let go of us. And, um, and is right there ready. And that covenant, that covenant that God makes with us in the waters of baptism, it, um, it is not broken. Uh, let's, um, any other thoughts there before we move on? We've got to do some worshipful work here. This, uh, these few chapters are not the most exciting again. Um, but, uh, so we, uh, we had... In the previous weeks, um, you know, Moses got all of the, um, the, the the architectural renderings of the tabernacle, and God gave Moses a plan for the building the building fund drive, and um, and the plans are done. And he went down, and it all it all went to Hades in a hand sack, and uh, and so then because they had already done their own building drive, and they've already started off you know their own projects with the calf, and then. Um, now we're getting to the point where the covenant's been renewed, and now all of the plans that God gave Moses in the beginning now they are being now they are being completed, and the tabernacle is being um, built as long as well as everything else. Um, look at chapter thirty-seven, or look at the um, how the ark of the covenant is put together. Bezael made the ark of acacia wood. It was two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold inside and out and made a molding of gold around it. He cast for it four rings of gold for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two on the other side. Okay, so I want you to get the idea that everything's happening just like was instructed. And um, everything, uh, everything's coming along um, just, just like it should. Um, in the previous week when we talked about this, we said, you have heard it said that the devil is in the details. Have you, when you look at a contract. Um, but I think in Scripture, it's the Lord that's in the details. And what that means for us is that um, it's not always the dramatic things in life where we meet the Lord. But we, we meet the Lord in the mundane details of life. That's what I like about the book of Esther. Doesn't, the book of Esther doesn't mention God. All that you got is politics, intrigue, marriages, and guess who's working the whole time in all the details? The Lord is. The Lord is un, unknown, not, not mentioned even in the text, but you, but you know it. You know it when you read the book of Esther. God is in the details of our life. Um, let's look at the book. Well, I, I wanted to talk for a little bit about um, a, uh, a, an idea that a lady named Wendy Bailey has written about. It's called Worshipful Work. She says churches need to move from business meetings to worshipful work. Anybody have an idea what that means to move from a business meeting to worshipful work? All 
Planning. All play and no work. All planning. Planning. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Jesus and shoe leather. Jesus and shoe leather. Yeah. yeah. I think that, um, boy, Methodists once were bad at this, really bad. We had what was called a board, administrative board, and a council on ministries. We had two different groups. We had the people that were like responsible for the numbers, the dollars and cents, and the, the power, and then the people that were responsible for doing ministry, right? Um, this turned out to be, as a whole, when, when somebody stood up at general conferences and said, hey, it, does everybody think this is a terrible idea to have people doing ministry and the people with the power being two different groups of people? And, and everybody said, yeah, that was a really dumb idea now that you mentioned it, and they changed it. So now we have the church council where ministry and decisions are, are, are meant to be made together so that, so that the ministry, the church is not here to manage buildings. It's not here to manage budgets. The church exists to make disciples and to spread the gospel and the love, the love of Christ through gospel action. And so worshipful work, I think, is something that the church needs to recover, that we are not a business, our, our business meetings ought to be prayer meetings as well. That, um, that, and we, in our church, we begin meetings with prayer and we close them with prayer. Um, and I think it, it's, it's good for us to grow into asking the Lord to help us in these meetings so that, um, so that they are um, worship at the same time. And uh, John Wesley would call this sometimes holy conferencing, where, um, where it's not just a meeting, but there, there's something sacrament. He called it a means of grace, like a sacrament. John Wesley believed that a church committee meeting could be all, could be almost sacramental. And that's ridiculous. Right? But I think that he's right. It could be sacramental if we if we if we are open to the spirit, um, God can use us and and, uh, and and transform us. And the next thing that's related to this is ora et labora. I just wrote it there in Latin so you wouldn't know yet what it was. Um, so you can write it in your margin. It means pray and work. Pray and work. This is the motto of the Benedictines. And I think that it is a wonderful motto because we can kind of think that these two things are opposites. That, well, you got people that are the praying people and you got the people that are the working people. Um, I'm a prayer, you're a worker. Um, that, that these, are, these are different functions. And, um, and the Benedictine, St. Saint, Saint Benedict said, you didn't join this monastery to pray all day. You're going to make bread. You're going to make liqueur, liqueur. <laughs> and tables. You're going to work, too, because you have to, because in the work, you, you also find God. And, that, and what Benedict really learned and taught is that prayer and work ought to be intermingled, and that, they can, that they, they could be the same thing. And, um, and I think that this, this work that we see of the tabernacle being built is God ordained work that is that is prayerful work. It's not it's not um, um, busyness. It's not, uh, most of our work is still the busyness. This is meaningful work um, that is that is filled with um, filled with a prayerful foundation. How can we learn to find work and life balance? What does a life that is balanced between prayer and spirit, prayer spirituality that's one concept work and family family life? What does it look like? Yeah. I wanted. I, I was like, Eve's dropping, and I heard a Brother Lawrence reference. Tell, tell us about that one group over here. There's a book I was reading uh, about a few years ago. Well, anyway, uh, Brother Lawrence, practice, practice of the Presence of God. Yeah. Before he tries to make it, I think Brother Lawrence was a monk. Washing a lot of dishes. I think. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, he said, in washing those dishes, if you, you know, God can be there. If you, in anything we do, in our work, if we if we practice this, God can be in every little thing we do. If we yeah. and, and, and it helps to practice. It is a wonderful book. Yeah, it is. Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, and uh, that's one of my favorite stories. And my wife reminds me of. You can, if you want to pray, you can get in and wash those dishes. <laughs> A, a constant theme in our house. Well, what would Brother Lawrence do? <laughs> yeah. So, um, any 
other group? Um, yeah. We talked about making God the center of your life, and I just talked about, you know, the foundation at home that we try to relate to our children, you know, about the Bible and teach them different yeah. concepts. And always do your very best. And I always look at things when I lead it as a, as a district manager to lead people by inspiration rather than intimidation. How would Jesus relate to people and lead people? And I w was always criticized for always being nice. <laughs> and that was like really bad, but I always got the job done and people would want to do more for me, no matter what. So I was very successful in that. So it's just that God is giving us all free will. And when we do our children, we teach them about the choices, the consequences. And then as they get older, they have the freedom to make their own choices. And, you know, you can be the best parent, but sometimes your kids can make bad choices. And they learn from that, but, like, I believe God gives us free will. Can you see what's on the back of his shirt? Make good choices. That's their thing. I think the CEO will make good choices, Matt. Yes. We all make good choices. That's right. We talked about consciousness, right? Um, being conscious. Being conscious. Yes, yeah, starting out with warnings as soon as we get up with prayer. You know, at the feet of Jesus and yeah. all throughout the day and even our tasks that we do at work, you know, okay, Lord, help me with this assignment and help me get through this thing and whatever, whatever. And then as we leave, leave work, coming home, bringing into our family lives, how was your day? How, how did God help you do that or so forth? Just being yeah. conscious. I, even when you speak to other people as well. I think that's so key. I think sometimes I can even pray without being conscious of the Holy Spirit. I mean, like, so I can certainly wash dishes without being conscious of the Holy Spirit. And I, can, I mean, like, but I, I, can, I can pray, I, I can read scripture and preach without being conscious. I mean, like, we have, I think that, that in order to find this right balance, is about being open. And what I hear from you is, um, is that work and life balance is really about priorities. Um, and I think I think that kind of goes with the good choices. Uh, I think that's I think that's great, and that we can serve the Lord in whatever in whatever task that we've been given to fulfill. And also to be intentional about our work. In other words, when we're going to do something, we should be having that decision or that way you're doing affect other people because it isn't always about you because yeah. you could do something that might make you feel better but it might affect someone else in not a wonderful way yeah I think that's wonderful um, to me it, it's, it's and we were kind of tied to sin about the opportunity I mean God's a consistent God we should be consistent people um, um, so many of us you know I want to be the same. I want to be the same person at home when it's just my wife and I as I am when I'm hanging out with you guys when I'm hanging out at work. And sometimes mm. uh, uh, a living witness, lifestyle evangelism, mm -hmm. and it's an opportunity to serve in so many ways. And instead of beating somebody over the head with a blunt end of the word, let the Holy Spirit cover with a sharp end of it. <laughs> uh, and, and how many of us, we've been talking about God in our perception, who is God that all of us base our conception of God based on how we perceive our earthly father. You know, if we had a raging father who was wrathful, that's kind of how we see God as this big bully who's raging and wrathful. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, I, I, you know, that's... It's hard to shake sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think we've, we've, we've had a lot of wonderful things brought out here that I think help us to talk about our work and life balance. And I guess the, um, that the key point that I would like to continue to emphasize is this one of, of being mindful, of a rather Lawrence idea. Um, Barbara Brand Taylor um, wrote a little book called The Preaching Life, and I give it to somebody when they tell me, oh, I'm thinking about, I think I might want to be a Methodist preacher. And in this book, um, she spends the first chapter trying to talk someone out of doing that. Um, she, she says, um, this person says, you know, I want to be a preacher. Um, and she says, no, why? She says, he said, um, well, you know, I want to be God's, I want to be a parson. I, I want to I be able to get on a bus and to tell someone about Jesus. And her answer is, 
You don't have to be a preacher to get on the bus and tell someone about Jesus. You're already God's person. I mean, just go and do it. You're a, you're, you're a, you're a carpenter. Just maybe God's calling you to be God's carpenter um, and not calling you to, um, to do sacraments. I mean, that, uh, that, that everything that we do it can be a ministry and, God, and a, vo a vocation. That, uh, that we can use to serve the Lord. I mean, I was thinking about it. They're all saints this Sunday. I mean, I think Martha Sanborn had reached more people for Jesus than about any Methodist preacher I know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, she just, as a coach and a, and a teacher, I mean, she, she could bring you in to church. And, um, and so, so that's, what, that's what ministry looks like. It looks like building this tabernacle. It looks like a lot of different ways, but, but God still does. Call, call some people to be priests and some people to build a tabernacle and everybody has their own role. Yes. I was just going to say, Skip and I had a little bit of a discussion about this at Bible study oh. this week, but you know, people keep saying they've taken uh, Christ out of church, I mean out of schools, God's not in the school. That would be to assume that there's not one Christian teacher or student in the whole building and that's, you know, kind of an affront to yeah. people who see themselves as Christians. So, right. you know, whatever profession we're in, God's with us. He's in us. He's part of us. And it's a, min it's a ministry where we can offer, we can offer the gospel. Um, we don't always need the, we need all the words like St. Francis probably didn't say, but he could have said, <laughs> you preach the gospel to all people and if necessary, use words. Yeah. yeah. He didn't really say that, but, but it's kind of like he did. So. <laughs> I like and wrote down what you said about that. What Bob really had to say, everybody must serve somebody. Yeah. Everybody must serve somebody. Well, um, let's, cl let's, let's close out our lesson here. Um, in chapter 39, verse 32, well, the work is done. Have you ever accomplished anything and said, wow, that was nice? I mean, uh, can you imagine when we get this building project done? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we have a thing and we say, wow, it's done. And doesn't that feel good? That's, we're done. I think this also, um, uh, Jesus, Jesus says from the cross in the fourth gospel, it is finished. It's done. He it says it in the book of Revelation. Um, it is done. And um, there, there's just such a beautiful poetic finality to this being complete. But even when it's done, it's not done. This is not ultimate, but penultimate. penultimate. It's the thing right before the thing. So just because they did all this ready to go, they got the tabernacle, they got the manatee hide covering the top, and they got everything just like the specs said to do it. But is it a temple yet? No, it is not. Just because we put it together doesn't mean anything. We're still lacking one thing to make it all go. And what is that? God's presence. God's presence, the Holy Spirit. So let's look at the last chapter, the very last pericope, verse 34. Let's go ahead and set up to 33. Let's start at 33. He set up the court around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the screen at the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. So now everything's done. Verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. The end. <laughs> so um, so it, it ends in a grand way. They built it, um, and he came. And um, it's not always the case. You cannot control the board. All you can do is open up the place, and the Lord does what the Lord does, like wildfire. We All we can do is, is ask and pray, be open, and the Lord does 
the Lord does. The Lord will send here and make this temple his dwelling place, this tabernacle his dwelling place. And uh, I love the, uh, the idea of moving, the tabernacle moving to wherever God calls it to move. That's kind of on that wildness of God. And, um, and so, a kind of closing thought, um, it really came out to me during a Henry Blackaby study, Experiencing God, where it asked the question, um, how come we usually start doing something and we say, Lord God, I just started this wonderful project and I need you to help join me to accomplish it. That's what we normally do. I just did this, I'm doing this thing here and I need you to help me do this. And Blackaby says that that is the wrong way. That we ought to say, God, what you doing right now in our world? What you doing out there? And we go and join God. And we drop whatever we're doing and go join God on that project. And uh, that that one day of Bible study, I will never forget because it's like a light bulb went out of my head. And I thought, well, this is the problem with all of my prayers. I'm always telling God what to do <laughs> instead of asking God what to do. And, um, and I still realize in my prayer life that I have trouble with this, with this because um, I think I know what God wants to do, so I don't need to ask. <laughs> and, and yet I think every day, like the Israelites, we stand back and we ask, okay, where, where are you going today? And, and drop our nets and go that direction. Instead of saying, Lord, come in here and help me catch these fish. Those disciples would have never never become apostles, but have never been disciples if they had asked Jesus to help them fish. Instead, they listened to what he told them to do, to follow. And so, um, Paul talks about how our bodies are a temple, and, um, and I think of them like our campaign, making space for God, that in our, in our life, in our bodies, we make space for the Holy Spirit, and we ask the Spirit to come and, um, and guide us and lead us, and, um, and I think the book of Exodus helps us um, make that same journey. This Exodus is our story. And uh, we're, we're the people that get lost in the wilderness for 40 years because we didn't ask God for direction. We're, we're, we, are, we are these people. We are the stiff-necked people. We're the ones who want to go back to Egypt because the melons were so good and the potted meat. I mean, we want to go back. We, we, are, we are the Israelites. And... Um, and this story is our story from start to finish, um, but it is a story about a God that delivers and redeems when we do not deserve it. A God that makes something out of nothing. Um, and that's uh, uh, one more little note here on, um, let's see, chapter 40, verse 16. I just want to highlight one other thing as a closing remark. Chapter 40. Moses did everything the Lord had commanded him. And the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. The first day. What's the significance there? Creation. So this tabernacle is set up, and it is like the new beginning of creation. That's my prayer for you and me, that we can um, be on the first day, the Lord's day. That's the day of resurrection. And, um, and start anew. And um, open our lives up to the pillar of fire and the cloud by day and um, follow wherever this wild God will take us. Let us pray. Merciful God, we are your exodus people. We were nobodies. And you, through your son, made us somebodies. You gave us a name you made us a people, and you gave us mercy. Help us to follow your spirit in our lives. Our bodies are your temple. Help us to like the tabernacle, to follow you <clears throat> wherever you might lead us, to be your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.